So thank you, Sharan and Preeti and everybody else at Red um, for inviting me. Uh, I wanted it to be a clickbaity title, so I think I'm glad I succeeded at that. It's a little surreal. It's actually, I, I'm in the Boston area and it's snowing outside my window. So, uh, I, you know, which is probably not what is happening in Bangalore right now. <laughs> uh, so thank you everybody for joining me. Um, the title is actually a take on a very famous, um, uh, you know, I mean, so software is eating the world is the, uh, is probably the phrase that many of you have heard. Um, and uh, Mark Andreessen uh, of the, you know, one of the inventors of Netscape and then now um, investors is the person responsible for that phrase. And so when I said design is eating the world, I was deliberately playing on that phrase. Um, just and and of course it you know prompts the question what is design what is eating and what's the world uh, I will not get into those uh, right now but let me tell you what the big picture is that I'm coming from and uh, um, and you know we this has been a pretty tumultuous year for uh, everybody I mean I think it's actually literally the first time in human history that everybody who is connected into the modern world, which is like I would say the vast majority of human beings are in exactly the same predicament. I mean, it's kind of, a, you know, it's like uh, uh, aliens came to the earth and announced in our heads that from now on you're our slaves or something like that. Uh, so the, the virus has managed to do something that aliens have not been able to do yet. And so I feel like 20, the 2020s might be the most important decade in human history. Um, and, and I don't mean it that uh, some, like the world will be unrecognizable at the end of it, but rather that the things that we do now will either um, mean that as a species we have a future or it will ensure that as a species we don't. <laughs> either way, I think it's going to be an important uh, um, decade and and so uh, for example climate change which is a topic on which uh, we at Socrates work a lot uh, the 2030 has been declared by the IPCC as a kind of watershed right that if we don't uh, achieve certain very very ambitious redu carbon reduction goals by 2030 it's we're going to be too late so uh, and that's just nine years from now yep. and nine years is not that much um, I can tell you that. Uh, and so, uh, so the, I'll tell you what the idea that I was coming from, and this is why I say design is eating the world, right? So there is a, there is this kind of almost um, too um, over ambitious a dream, but I think that needs to happen, which I call posterity. And when I say posterity, I mean that. Uh, we need to build a planetary operating system. That's my uh, claim, right? That, that, you know, the way that we're doing right now where different countries and different peoples are doing their own thing and not able to coordinate and not able to um, figure out a way to keep uh, both human civilization and the uh, non-human world around us sustainable, not gonna work. And so my claim is that we need a planetary operating system, right? And so why do we need one? I just mentioned, which is that um, we need a coordinated way of, I mean, this is sort of a dream that's been going on for a while. So if you think about at the end of the first world war, when the League of Nations was first uh, created, it was again, this idea that we need to move towards a world government, otherwise we're gonna fight each other to the death. Unfortunately, of course, the League of Nations didn't work out and we had a second world war, which was even worse than the first. And then the United Nations came up, right? Which was this idea that, okay, maybe, but the UN has not been successful at, uh, uh, at least the most important human challenges, including climate change. And so therefore I feel like we need a, the next version of the same idea. And that's what I call a planetary operating system. Right, and so, um, and that's where the name comes from. So posterity is a planetary operating system. Uh, and 
then the question is, of course, what will it take to design a planetary operating system? And, there, and if, there, if design plays a big role in creating such a system, then of course design is gonna eat the world. So that's the, that's the origin of the clickbait at the beginning, <laughs> okay? Um, I, uh, let me ask a question of everyone who's here. How many of you read science fiction? And if you don't read it, just you know, drop off the call and never come back to these again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, yeah. I've, I've read the, uh, you know, not too many. I've, I've read actually a couple of books from, uh, from him. Yeah. Yeah. So Arthur C. Clarke, again, if you are a person of a certain age, I mean, so, you know, uh, I grew up reading um, Asimov and Clarke because those were the people available in India when I was a kid. And one of the stories that has stuck with me and might have even been the first Arthur C. Clarke novel I read it's called the city and the stars right and this is um this is a novel in which um we are talking about hundreds of millions of years perhaps billions of years in the future and um the earth has dried up except for these cities that are fully fully controlled right and so um one of the things that the novel says in its uh, in one of its locations is that basically what had happened is humans had figured out how to go into space but then they had met other civilizations that were so far ahead that they decided okay you know and this is a very famous by the way um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke phrase from another novel from 2001 that the stars are not for man right uh, and so uh, what humans discovered is that yeah the stars are not for you because you're not smart enough or you're not kind enough or something like that so they came back and they worked on themselves for a hundred million years so that's what supposedly they did in that uh, uh in the book and so i think that's where we are at now um when i say uh we we are uh in this situation where we've kind of gone and settled not the stars but we have tried we have settled the whole earth and we have figured out that we're not very good at doing that and so we need to work on ourselves um, to do it better i mean that to me that's our biggest challenge and and unfortunately unlike uh, the city and the stars where you have 100 million years to figure that out we have 10 years to, <laughs> to do that and that's a slightly harder problem right so you know there are certain tools that have helped us expand very, very rap uh, successfully across the earth. Um, I mean, the numbers are, of course, hard to determine, but about 100,000 years ago, there were maybe 1,000 human beings or maybe 10,000, like some very small number. And now there are, I mean, so we have expanded by six or seven orders of magnitude in, uh, in 100,000 years, which is, in a sense, the most successful mammalian growth pattern ever. Right, and uh, I mean the other species in the world may not agree with our success, uh, but uh, we've been very successful. But we've reached our limits, and so then the question is, what do we do about our limits? Right, and this is where the Arthur C. Clarke idea is that we need to kind of um, rewind. Uh, this image, by the way, I, I hope everybody can see the slide, is a famous. It's a it's a Greek mythology. Uh, sort of fictitious animal called the Ouroboros, right? It's a snake that eats its own tail. And um, if you've ever read uh, Gödel Escher Bach by Hofstadter, uh, I think he mentions Ouroboros in it. Uh, that's another iconic book, at least from my generation. Uh, and um, so I would say that we need to kind of go back and eat ourselves. Uh, we, are, we have not... Uh, uh, you know we have eaten the rest of the world pretty well so it's time that we um, unwind that long history and see if we can you know do humans 2.0 that's sort of the, my claim and i don't mean it in this techno scientific sense i think we need a much more empathetic view of uh, our future rather than a techno scientific one and that's why i think design is very important right that we need to uh, like instead of having sort of unquestioned imaginations of you know some uh, star trek future how do we actually reimagine ourselves in a way that um, we can inhabit the world that we are in right and so uh, 
And we can't do it in a haphazard way. We've kind of grown into 7 billion plus, or it'll probably be 9 billion uh, at some point um, in, a, in a haphazard way. We haven't really thought through that future, but I think that time has come. Sure. All right. Um, and so then the question is, how do we redesign ourselves? Um, and this is where I come to. So this is a famous myth, uh, you know, of uh, Ganesha and Murugan and Shiva and Parvati, right? So um, Shiva and Parvati uh, tell Ganesha and Murugan that whoever who goes around the world um, fastest and comes back is the winner, right? And um, and Murugan, of course, takes off on his peacock, and he's like. And, but everywhere he goes, he sees that Ganesha is ahead of him, even though he's got a mouse rather than a peacock. Uh, and then when he comes back, he noticed that Ganesha is just um, circum, uh, navigating just his parents, right? So he's just going around his parents. And it turns out that, therefore, the claim is that if you are Shiva and Parvati, you're better off being um, circumnavigated yourself rather than uh, going around the earth. And so in the same way, I think if you think of the mind as, as a cognitive scientist, you shouldn't be surprised um, that the mind to me is where the action is. And therefore, instead of going around the world, we can just go around the mind and that should be um, good enough. And to me, that's sort of the idea that I wanted. So the, the scientific idea that is at the heart of this presentation is that we need to really understand the mind in a way that helps us then flourish in the future, right? So this mind as the seat of flourishing uh, to me is the question. So of course, uh, um, people who like perhaps many people in this call who are designing um, products, apps, uh, interfaces uh, are already using some of these principles, right? That you, you want to create experiences that people find, um, like you want to evoke an emotion. Typically it's some kind of delight, but it could be other emotions too, right? And so then the question is, how do you design the mind and how do you cultivate this full being, uh, the embodied being? This, by the way, is the Vitruvian man that uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, drew. Uh, so one of the iconic pictures of uh, what it is to be human. All right. And so that uh, brings me to the next stage of my talk, uh, the mind and person. And this is perhaps going to be a little technical, so I hope will bear with me, but I'm happy to take questions at this stage. I've just got one right now, uh, which is, uh, you did talk, talk about the, uh, what do you call it, expanding uh, population and such. Uh, there are others who argue that uh, uh, we have felt this at every stage, whenever we've doubled uh, in mm -hmm. the past, uh, we, all, we always felt that the earth couldn't sustain, it couldn't sustain. But we always found a way, apparently. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they expect that uh, the, that this will actually continue till 11 billion as a population. Well, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts there? I mean, so of course, um, you know, one person living in the first world is different from one person living in, uh, you know, a, a, a poor neighborhood in, in Mumbai or, or Delhi or anywhere. Right. And so it's really the per capita energy and resource consumption that we have to be looking at. I mean, 11 billion people living like Western Europeans and Americans, not, I mean, that's just not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we all desire, right? I mean, come on. I mean, I, we should also be honest about what we consider to be a good life. And that tends to be pretty resource intensive. And so then the question is you can't have both. So we've got to decide which one. Right. There are more questions. I'll take them too. Otherwise, uh, not at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So I'm now going to come to. So this is sort of, in a sense, I'm going to give a very brief overview on what might be the cognitive science of flourishing. And uh, so, what is flourishing, right? And this is the kind of the dictionary definition of a person, animal, or other living organism grow or develop in a healthy or vigorous way, especially as the result of a particularly favorable environment, right? So it's a very deep concept. Um, it's a concept which is there pretty much in every culture that I know of, right? Uh, the idea being that, uh, that human beings 
uh, and other species. I mean, like it's flourishing is the one thing that you could say unifies all of life. All of life uh, desires to flourish. Uh, okay, so now there are um, different kinds of flourishing, right? You might say subjective, objective, and collective. Subjective flourishing is the self, like the experience of feeling uh, uh, like you are a flourishing person, that you're feeling good. So, of course, pleasure is the most it's an easily available uh, marker of that. Do you feel good? Like if somebody asks you, how are you feeling? And you say, I'm feeling good. And you are um, saying that truthfully and not just as a kind of a rhetorical uh, response, then that is the subjective experience of flourishing, right? That of, uh, and typically uh, pleasure, happiness, uh, maybe joy, these are the emotions uh, or feelings that people associate with subjective flourishing, right? And that's a huge part of it. Um, I mean, all like I would say that pretty much uh, all of religion, all of uh, advertising, all of uh, 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 you know maybe even politics is designed to make people feel a certain way. So, um, so, so it's a growth industry, so to speak. Uh, uh, then uh, there are the objective conditions that help you flourish. And now we have a decent, uh, people have done uh, good studies over the last hundred years or so, as in what, it, what are the things that uh, help you flourish? And perhaps the best known um, version of it is, uh, in fact, the ideas developed by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum on what's called capability theory. So there are certain kinds of capacities if you as an individual uh, have access to. These are the capabilities. Then, so, and these are capable. So uh, there's a bouquet of capabilities. For example, uh, education is one of them. Uh, spatial freedom is another, right? That you're not prevented from being in certain spaces. Uh, dignity is a third. So, so there's a bouquet of features in the social world, the social conditions that um, help you flourish. So these are what I would call the objective and the collective aspects of flourishing, right? So the objective would be you have access to air, water, so you know the, the necessity of food, the necessities of life. And the collective are the social conditions, right? So that you are treated in a dignified way, you are allowed, you are represented in spaces that make decisions about your life. So in parliament, in uh, uh, you know, panchayats and so on and so forth. And so um, how do we bring all of these together? And what is the cognitive science of that um, subjective and objective flourishing is a question that, um, I certainly like to think about a lot, and there are other people who do that. Okay. And this, of course, this science uh, has a technology, so to speak, that goes with it. And when I say technology, I really mean design, because it's, I think design is the, you could say, the applied discipline that uh, is most likely to promote flourishing. Right? Uh, medicine in a very health and medicine in a very different way is doing the same thing, right? Uh, but uh, I would say that design is an underexplored area in the world of flourishing. So, uh, as I said, uh, flourishing is universal and all living beings desire to flourish. Um, but at the same time, uh, we want to uh, sort of maybe consciously enable the process of flourishing, right? And that's why I say design is uh, universal because if all beings desire to flourish and design is the grammar through which uh, that flourishing is enabled, then design is universal. And it therefore, instead of maybe uh, eating the world, it uh, let the world, lets the world grow. So it's the opposite, right? Um, and, but as far as I can tell, and this is where um, you can correct me, uh, but as far as I can tell, there is no kind of real systematic ex uh, discipline or a domain of inquiry, which is the design of flourishing, right? I mean, there's positive psychology uh, and uh, there are people like, uh, uh, <clears throat> so Martin Seligman is the best known uh, um, psychologist associated with positive psychology. Uh, you know, there's the Amartya Sen and Martha Nesbaum 
capability approach to economics. There are cognitive scientists studying emotions, but it's not been bundled together into, a, you could say, a technology or a design of flourishing. And I don't know why. Uh, and to me, that's the question that I want to uh, throw at you guys. Right? And, and part of it is, of course, that uh, we had still have very poor models of integrating uh, technology into flourishing, right? Uh, the typical models, I mean, I mean, I'm talking on Zoom. Uh, you guys are in Bangalore. Many of you are in Bangalore. I'm in Boston. Some of you might be in Delhi and Bombay. So there is a kind of disembodied uh, experience that we are all having right now, right? And that, uh, but uh, we are not disembodied creatures. We are ultimately physical creatures. We are located in um, uh, certain places. And uh, how do we combine the digital and the physical to flourish is going to be a big challenge. I mean, uh, and I'm sure Zoom and other companies are trying to figure out how to give the best experience to the people who are on their calls, but we need to go you know, several steps beyond that. Uh, but the traditional image of uh, thinking being, which is popularized in, you know, uh, sci-fi novels, in movies, in that everyday metaphor now, is that the mind and intelligence are somehow disembodied, they're abstract, right? It's just zeros and ones. But a new approach to the mind, it's called embodied cognition, basically says that the mind is not accidentally embodied. It's not as if somebody uh, took a body that otherwise wouldn't have a mind and then placed a brain in it and voila, it becomes smart. It, but rather that you have to have a body to have a mind. And this is a very uh, relatively new idea, but now almost 30 years old. Uh, and um, and it's, a very, it's, it's the uh, cognitive science discipline that I was both trained in and I appreciate. Right. And so that says that the mind is intrinsically embodied. It's spread across the brain, the body and the environment. So to give you a very um, quick example, right, that uh, almost all the languages that we speak have prepositions that are spatial. Right? So in English, you have in front of, behind, to the you know, side of. Uh, and the reason is because we are uh, embodied creatures. We're front and back. We, we're not, we are asymmetric front and back. We're also asymmetric top and down. And so to be able to call out those directions is actually of importance to us, right? Both in our perceptual experience and how language talks about it. And, uh, and there are some very, very interesting subtleties there. So for example, uh, if you uh, go into a temple, so you enter through the front of the temple, but typically then inside you're at the back of the temple, right? Uh, and so there are these very subtle um, ways in which space has been organized uh, over the centuries in, through architecture and other um, mm -hmm. disciplines, uh, which we are tacitly aware of, but we rarely pay close attention to. Right, and so I wanna come back to this capabilities approach, right? And so the capabilities are a person's real freedoms to achieve functioning. So meaning, suppose that, uh, which I had mentioned several times, right, that you should be able to um, travel without restriction. Incidentally, that's the one thing, as we all know, both in India and elsewhere, is one of the biggest uh, uh, obstacles. And in fact, uh, it's the thing that people seem to fight about the most. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the idea is that, um, you know, there shouldn't be a genuine obstacle to you being in, in and so if that's being curtailed then you have a real freedom that is being curtailed um, and so in that sense uh, traveling from a to b is a functioning and the opportunity to travel or the capacity to travel is the capability but that's the basic idea right that capabilities are the things that you are the specific freedoms that you are uh, capable of achieving. So for example, it could also be that uh, you want to be a computer programmer or you want to be a designer, right? So actually being a designer is a functioning, but the capacity, the availability of that to you because you have the right educational opportunities is the capability. Right? 
Uh, and you could argue that, I mean, there are many, many, I mean, we, could, we may all want certain freedoms and capabilities, but the question is, is there a basic set? And one answer to that is there are certain bodily freedoms and bodily capabilities that are the most basic, right? So you should, I mean, you should be able to live a life without injury. I think that that's a pretty basic capability. You should be able to, again, um, walk or uh, run anywhere you want, right? That's a basic capability. And it, of course, and that is different from being able to migrate to any part of the world. I should also acknowledge that, right? right? Uh, and so on and so forth. And you could argue that as, so this is where cognitive science becomes interesting as a substrate for design as well as policy. And the reason is because if you think that the bodily capabilities are the ones that everybody should have access to, right? Food, right? And, and this is the um, kind of scientific version of the famous roti kapra or makan, right? right? Uh, and so it tells you that there is a kind of scientific basis to that claim, right? And so the claim is therefore that bodies are the canonical source of well-being and the lack of bodily well-being is the basic kind of lack that we suffer from. And, and chances are that, you know, people in this call are mostly not suffering from that uh, bodily lack. It could be it's far more likely in some ways that there are mental illnesses than bodily illnesses. But of course, um, uh, you know, we all age and we all die. So at some point, uh, we're going to face bodily lacks. Okay. Um, so living bodies, they are uh, the locus of the science of flourishing. And um, and that also brings an interesting challenge again for the design world because if you think about it, most of the design that happens right now, especially interface and uh, other kinds of technologically enhanced design, it's for the eyes, right? Um, yeah, it's a very eye-centric design uh, discipline, but the body is of course much more than the eye. The skin is actually the single biggest organ in it. And so then the question is, how would you design for the skin? I mean, clothing, perfume, um, some of the older fashion disciplines are more, you could say, skin focused than, uh, than uh, user interface design is. But they are also, they, you know, software hasn't eaten those disciplines yet. So then the question is, what does the future of the technologies of the skin look like? I don't know. I mean, you guys should be able to answer those questions. Right. Um, so what we need, therefore, and this is where you could say that like, we need a kind of principles of embodied flourishing. Uh, and um, to be fair, for, the, like, for those principles to be fair and just, they should obey certain uh, you know, symmetry uh, you know, considerations. A very famous version of that is by the American philosopher, John Rawls, uh, The Veil of Ignorance. So John Rawls basically said that if you want to design a society, you should do it in such a way that when you are designing it, you as the person, as the designer of the social rules, should not know who you are, right? right? Like meaning, if you're a powerful person and you're designing the society, like typically people who design societies are powerful people, and, the clay, and they actually rig the system to benefit people like them. So what Rawls basically said is that in the process of designing a fair society, you should either explicitly or implicitly have a, system, um, a way of doing it that prevents you from knowing where you are going to be in the future society that you design, right? So, so for example, and this is a, uh, these are studies that have been done uh, extensively, right? That if you ask a typical Republican voter in the US, uh, what kind of, whether you want a capitalist or a socialist society. So if you want, uh, you know, the Southern United States, Texas or Sweden uh, are your choices. A typical Texan would say Texas, right? But then if you ask them that you won't know where, whether you're going to be rich or poor and so on, here are the things that are going to be offered to you in Texas. Here are the things that are going to be offered to you in Sweden. They, 
very quickly shift towards liking Sweden more, <laughs> right? And so, uh, so that's the thing, right? That that in a world where you don't know where your uh, next meal is going to come from, you're better off in a place where society kind of guarantees that meal. I mean, it's not a very uh, a profound right. realization there, right? Okay, so this is um, so this is sort of my brief overview of the science. So I'm now willing to take the uh, next set of questions, if there are any. I, ha I have a couple, I, but I fear you're going to answer it next anyway. But uh, <laughs> let me just ask it. Uh, so uh, here, here's where our problem is. So you, you just brought up so many points. I, I, my mind is swimming with questions. Um, so the software side of the world, for example, I think uh, deals with the mind flourishing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the hardware design side of the world deals with the skin as the organ. I, right. That's why I'm kind of like uh, associating it. So in our world, uh, when we are designing software or application systems and so on, we have clear goals set by the business uh, that we are working mm -hmm. with. You know, and uh, that is one core set of uh, goals that, uh, you know, uh, I, I like to argue that we are the servant of two masters, but we are paid by one of them. So <laughs> we have to argue for, <laughs> argue for one of them, just a practical necessity. But there are a lot of things that they don't already specify. So therein lies our freedom to uh, design for everything else. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Rajesh, uh, should be our goals? Uh, and I'm not uh, talking only with respect to e-commerce systems or other uh, apps that uh, we uh, possibly work with, we work with FinTech and so on. So mm -hmm. where, what, what do you think would, should be the right goal uh, that we set for ourselves? So, I mean, I don't know how much freedom you have, right? I mean, and it may vary from customer to customer. Uh, but for example, let's take FinTech, where I would say trust is, designing for trust, I bet you, is going to be a huge part of what even the user experience is like. Absolutely. And so one of the questions would be, how do you give that experience of trust? Uh, and trust is not something that you feel intellectually, right? You kind of have to feel it in your body. And so to me, that's an example of a bodily experience. And I do, I mean, I'm not the, uh, the expert here, but then the question is, how do you use a screen on which people are going to interact with your app to actually give a bodily experience of trust? Like, are there going to be touch experiences? I mean, how, and, and, and of course, uh, I, I, uh, I didn't have, I don't think I have a slide here about that, but touch is the, you could say the original, um, organ of trust, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, the, the touch between mother and child is the, uh, is the literally the, the beginning of uh, human existence for all of us, sure. right? And so how I feel like learning from those um, experiences might be things that are worth designing for. And which again, because my suspicion would be that your customers are unlikely to be thinking about those kinds of uh, things. So you have perhaps an opportunity to insert some of these ideas there, sure. right? And so emotion, I mean, I feel like trust as an emotion is um, especially now, I mean, I don't know about um, um, the, the users of, uh, you know, all the apps that you might be designing for, but my feeling, and I personally feel it, right? Like I'm now suspicious of technology companies and of every, right? And so how do we, I mean, like, how do you genuinely, so not as a, uh, you know, dark pattern, but as a genuine um, design principle, how do you take uh, users' suspicion about uh, collecting their data about, so how, what? what is the, uh, language, what is the visual experience, what is the sensory experience of those kinds of interfaces? I think it's going to be a big part uh, in my view. Sure. But I think uh, you argued in your article uh, that you written mm -hmm. on Medium where you said that we are generating data just by sitting on the couch, right? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> not a lot of us are aware of that fact. Uh, is, right. Should it be the purview of the app or uh, the yeah. designer to communicate that idea? To develop that I idea? think so. I think so, right? And in fact, for example, um, now, especially when we are on our couches all the time, right? We are, we are sort of somewhat restricted in our movements. We can't be in public spaces that much. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the... Um, and, and in fact, just this morning, before I um, joined the call, 
I, you know, I, I subscribe to this newsletter called Morning Brew. I don't know if you guys yeah. do. But okay. um, yeah. So, more, so if you look at the stock performance and, the, and also the revenue and the profits of the big tech companies, they have done exceptionally well in the last 10 months, yeah. right? Amazon yeah. in particular. Yeah. And so, um, so in some sense, to me, one of the shifts that has happened forever in this last 10 months is that technology companies and their ways of looking at the world have come inside our homes in a way that they did not uh, 10 months ago. But we've just accepted that. Sure. And so I feel like design is going to have to play a big role in communicating what that means, right? That, they, that you are now, that home is no longer a, kind of a private space in that sense. Sure. But uh, you bring me to the next question, which is, it's a cultural concept as well. Uh, yes. What trust is, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, privacy is, uh, if I play to privacy or uh, uh -huh. argue about privacy, uh, a person in the US cares about it. Uh, right. but a person in India or China, uh, you know, where we live in society where everybody knows each other, and, you know, right. everything about every, everybody, uh, it, it doesn't play as high a, a, a big a role. Uh, how do we argue here? But then the question is, what are still the principles? Like, meaning, I don't think any. Um, so Indians may trust their friends and their family members in ways that, say, the uh, people in the, uh, especially Northern Europe and in North America, might not. Right? Uh, Italians and Spaniards are probably a lot more like Indians than than they are like uh, uh, Germans. I think. Right. Right. Um, I I feel like finding out. So mm -hmm. I I mean. This to me is a kind of an opportunity for the kind of design research to see what is it that people are looking for, right? Right? Like, like, um, I like WhatsApp has become, uh, you know, central to the Indian experience because it seems to like, like every. I mean, I keep getting added to WhatsApp groups that I don't want to be part of, <laughs> right? Uh, and so. To me, uh, like to me, that's an example of, uh, it's not even about privacy, right? So I feel like I want certain spaces in which I am welcomed in certain ways. How do we design for that? Um, like what is a good WhatsApp group experience for an Indian strikes me as a, is a, like, an, uh, like a hypothetical design challenge. I mean, we don't have control over what Zuckerberg is going to actually do, but it might be interesting to, uh, to ask like what like if you if you were to design a whatsapp experience for indians what might that look like i think it might be an interesting uh, thought experiment sure cool i just want to mention to everybody else who's just joined in um, uh, i i just allowed the un unmute uh, yourself thing uh, because i think uh, we recognize a lot of the people here so please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question when when, when you feel like it. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the final portion of this, which is what I call, uh, you know, the bringing it together, right? So, um, uh, uh, a well-known philosopher who uh, I never really learned, from, I mean, I never studied with him directly, but somebody who was very influential in my discipline, uh, Jerry Forder said, every idea has two lives, uh, once in philosophy and then second in cognitive science. Right. And so I would say that the mind, because we are in this technological world where you know, you're um, spewing data, even when sitting on a couch, um, like our minds are being constantly engaged by forces that are not within our control. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and uh, and so we now have gone from, like you could say that, you know, we were first in religious societies, then we were in scientific societies. Um, you might argue that India is uh, not much of uh, a scientific society, but that, you know, nevertheless, our, the basic structures of our lives are influenced by science, right? And now technology, you could argue, is a bigger force than science. And we are in cognitive societies, right? Societies where our minds are constantly being engaged. And, uh, and we don't even know what's happening. I, I mean, I don't, and some of it is malicious, but I think some of it is just, we have stumbled into a new world that we don't know, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I feel like that's what designing these cognitive societies is going to be 
uh, big challenge. So, so I say this because um, if you look at the people, who, like the things that we now take for granted as um, part of the infrastructure of social life, right? Governments, banks, um, voting systems, first past the post, right? These are all typically were done by scientists and philosophers in the 17th, 18th century, 19th centuries, right? Like how many, like do you, should you have a proportional representation system or a first past the post system? These are all kind of intellectual questions that have now become baked into uh, uh, the infrastructure of life, right? And so I feel like now we are at the stage where there will be kind of uh, the infra mental infrastructure that people 50 years from now will take for granted that's gonna happen now. Right. And it's actually already happening now, right? So in this world of information flow, um, where viruses can upend your life for months on end, uh, we don't know how to design for that kind of world, but you're gonna have to do that over the next decade, right? And um, the idea that I wanna leave with is an idea called a natural mode. I am sure, uh, given that you guys are in many of you are in design, you've heard the term affordance, mm -hmm. right? Incidentally, affordance is a term that came from a psychologist, a cognitive scientist, psychologist, uh, James Gibson. Yeah. So what he ba he basically pointed out that chairs tell you sit on me, right? That in fact, I not. I mean, chairs are of course explicitly designed, but a flat rock also uh, immediately tells a human being that it's something that can be sat on, and so that's what that's the basic idea of an affordance. But a natural mode is a generalization of. Uh, and affordance, right? It's the kind of regularities that are there in the world. So let me give you an example. So if you're in a streetscape, right? Um, so you have a flat, so you have shop fronts uh, typically uh, on the, on the uh, street side. It would be kind of strange to have shop fronts on the third floor and residences on the uh, ground floor, right? I mean, you just take for granted. But that's because our minds kind of work in a certain way. Right? Our eyes are at a certain level. So if you want shiny new things to catch uh, people's attention, it's better that they are at eye level, uh, right? Of course, motion is a huge part of uh, uh, attention grabbing. And so it's not surprising that uh, people use uh, TV uh, or whatever animated displays to draw attention as well. But the basic idea of an affordance, uh, I mean, of a natural mode is that if you take a, a street layout, you will see certain things that are because human bodies are kind of um, have certain natural um, clusters, right? Um, so in a well-designed city, you will have, uh, you can see this, this is probably a 24 foot or more footpath right there, right? I mean, and so the kind of principles that um, architects and others have thought about for good urban layouts and design can be actually brought into the design to me of uh, digital experiences as well. So that's sort of the uh, takeaway that I want to uh, end with here. And when I say going for growth, uh, what I mean is that, you know, we can we create knowledge by design, not, not scientific knowledge, but the knowledge of a flourishing world, right? Which is that can we, create a world in which people experience information flows, all of these things in a way that helps them flourish and doesn't exploit them. I mean, that to me is the, uh, because you know, as of now, um, very smart people are trying to figure out how to rip you off. Uh, and, <laughs> and so the question is, can we try to do something about it? Uh, can we do better? Right, and so I'll, I'll, so here is the dream. So when I said I started with this planetary operating system, I want to give you this. Let me just see if I can fit. I don't know if wait. I think I might have to stop. So this is uh, uh, you won't see the, you won't hear what I'm hearing, but this is humpback whales, uh, right, and somebody swimming next to them, right. So I'm gonna just pause that. And my question is, is it possible to design, like, you know, this is a whale seen from the outside, 
Now, but imagine fitting sensors and other things on a whale, and you could just be a whale for a day. What would it be like? I don't know. And to me, that's the, that's the example of an experience um, that I think is now possible. I don't think the technology is any longer the, um, the limiting factor. obstacle. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think the technology is the limiting factor. It's our imagination and our capacity to design these kinds of experiences, right? And I think that those will go much further in saving our planet than, uh, than policies, right? Like, you know, just as literature kind of opened us to the lives of people, I mean, um, you can you can watch a Hollywood movie from 1920 and still feel like oh wow you know was lovely, right? And so that so movies and and uh, novels have kind of expanded our minds. Now the question is, what's the next kind of such expansive experience? And and I think to me this is the kind of like being a whale strikes me as something that I would, I mean, I don't know, maybe I won't want to come back to being a human after that. <laughs> right. Sorry. So let's see. How, yeah. So that's, so the question really that I want to go, when I say going for broke is uh, when we design digital experiences, it should just be experiences that open up human worlds to us. They should be experiences that open up perhaps the rest of the natural world to us. To me, that's sort of the, uh, to the bleeding edge of technology meets science, in my view, right? Because that's the thing that, uh, so the big, biggest perhaps question in my discipline, but perhaps in all of science, uh, is you know, what is consciousness? And so I feel like uh, learning how to be a whale will tell us more about consciousness than uh, just thinking about it. So, um, and th these are all ideas, right, that um, come from a um, architect, designer, someone who's very influential in software architecture called Christopher Alexander. So uh, I've been borrowing sort of con continuously from his uh, ideas throughout this talk. And uh, yeah, I think the, the only way it's gonna happen is through a community of practice that has all kinds of people in it. Right, I mean, there's like scientists know how the mind perhaps works a little bit, but they don't know how to design experiences for it. Designers know how to uh, design experiences, but they don't know how the mind works. So this is like a new kind of uh, merger waiting to happen. And I think that is my last slide. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Manish, I just had one last question, if you don't mind uh, taking it. Uh, you had mentioned elsewhere that uh, that design is replacing logic. Uh, mm. The idea f kind of fills me with fear as much as delight. So, <laughs> you mind expanding on that a little. <laughs> so, I'm saying that it's already doing that, right? Like when you see uh, fake news, fake news is a great example where um, you're you're designing systems to propagate a certain kind of emotion rather than through reason. I mean, it's just a fact, right? And so I'm saying my, we should be very thoughtful about that because that, like, people, I don't think you can roll back. I mean, you can roll back fake news, but the systems that are capable of giving those emotions are not going to go back. So the question is, how do you design for those uh, to make people flourish rather than get angry. I think anger uh, seems to be the single biggest emotion on the internet. Yeah, I agree. Right? <laughs> and so then the question is, how do we uh, design for other emotions and not just anger? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rajesh. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic thing, uh, a fantastic talk that you just uh, gave us. The, the thing is that I've got so many ideas just uh, generated over here, and I think that was your end goal anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it will keep us thinking about this uh, as we go along and do our work now. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you mind if we share the slides uh, on our website? No problem. Okay, great. Uh, we would also love to share the recording of the entire talk on our YouTube channel as well. If that's okay. If that's okay. Just let, yeah, it's fine with me. Absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.
Right. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, it's it, this was a great talk. Thanks again. Thanks again. Have a good Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.